Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will slowly begin to welcome you as people are still logging on to this webinar that is co-organized by the European Security and Defense College, ESDC, and uh, the Egmont Royal Institute for International Relations um, on the occasion of the awarding of the 2020 edition of the annual Global Strategy PhD Prize. And I have the pleasure of warmly welcoming and congratulating Dr. Marlene Meiske from the University of Oxford, who will uh, present her work to us uh, today. Uh, my colleague, Professor Nina Villain, who is the Africa Director at the Egmont Institute, she will um, offer, offer a response. And then of course, uh, ladies and gentlemen in the virtual audience, Later, uh, the floor is yours, and I will ask you to put your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, section. You can do that already during uh, the lecture, and then we will pick them up later. Uh, the topic is uh, burden sharing in peacekeeping. There are many uh, actors involved. All of the main uh, actors is um, obviously the United Nations. You see the UN Peacekeeping Medal right here. For us here, uh, sitting in Brussels, there is, of course, the European Union. This is the CSDP medal, CLASP, Altia, for Bosnia. Um, there is also NATO, uh, NATO medal with CLASP Kosovo. Obviously, the member states uh, play a big role. So, see the Belgian medal for uh, external operations. And uh, in the work of Malina, the African Union, uh, also is a major player, but I don't have a medal of the African Union in my collection, unfortunately, so I can't uh, show you uh, show you that. Um, with that silly intermezzo, I think I've killed enough time to allow people to log on, and I first uh, give the floor to Dirk Dubois, the head of the ESDC. Please, Dirk. Good morning, thank you Sven, and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar at the occasion of the award of the sixth Global Strategy PhD Prize to Dr. Malin Meiske. Congratulations. Normally, I would have the pleasure of meeting you in person and to hand over the prize together with uh, Professor Biscop during one of the ESDC's activities. However, this year, taking into account the current situation in the pandemic, we thought it would be a good idea to give the opportunity to the laureate to present her dissertation online. Dr. Meiske is not a newcomer to the EU scene, as in the past she has worked as a junior analyst for one of the ESDC's closest partners, the EU ISS. As a German national, she studied and graduated in Oxford, where she presented her PhD dissertation written under the supervision of Dr. Andrea McGarry in November 2019. Currently, she works for the After Exit Research Project, nothing to do with Brexit, but looking into the question of how the withdrawal of United Nations peacekeepers affects state capacity and delivery of public services in the states where a peacekeeping operation took place. The Global Strategy PhD Prize is awarded annually to a doctoral dissertation drafted in one of the working languages of the EU's Common Foreign and Security Policy, which addresses a policy relevant topic related to the foreign security and defense policy of the European Union, and that falls within the remit of the European Union Global Strategy. The jury of this prize is composed by Professor Dr. Sven Biskop, myself and representatives from EU institutions and the academic community. As many of you probably already know, the ESDC consists of a network of almost 200 training and education institutes and think tanks. One of our main objectives is to further enhance the European Union security and defense culture within the Union and to promote the principles laid down in Article 21 of the Treaty of the European Union outside of the Union. Well, usually I focus on the first part of that sentence, on the uh, establishment of a common security and defense culture. But today I want to join on the second part and to quote part of the Article 21.1. The Union's action on the international scene 
shall be guided by respect for the principles of the United Nations Charter and international law. The Union shall seek to develop relations and build partnerships with third countries and international, regional and global organizations which share the principles referred to in the first subparagraph. It shall promote multilateral solutions to common problems, in particular in the framework of the United Nations. End of quote. This is, of course, also reflected in the EU global strategy. Now, in her dissertation on burden sharing in peace operations, quantitative studies on the global, regional and national level, Dr. Maiske analyzed in three articles the dynamics between and within the European Union and its member states, the United Nations and the African Union. As she stated, peacekeeping is one of the principal tools available to the international community to manage armed conflicts and create sustainable peace. However, the vast scale and scope of today's peace operations accompanied by great financial and personnel burdens regularly threaten to outstrip the willingness and capacity of the international community, leading to delays and commitment gaps for peace operations. She addresses these challenges and advances our understanding of the dynamics, interdependencies, and motivating factors for force generation and peacekeeping burden sharing. This dissertation highlights that only a comprehensive understanding of the interdependent burden sharing decisions between numerous actors at multiple levels allows us to enhance the, the rapid response and effectiveness of peace operations. The jury was particularly impressed by the scope and the ambition of this big picture dissertation which yields insights that are directly relevant for the European Union. In the words of Dr. Meiske, peacekeeping is multilateralism in action. Having been a UN peacekeeper myself a long time ago and a lifetime adamant fan of the added value of the European Union, I look very much forward to listening to you, Dr. Meiske. The virtual floor is all yours. Thank you very much for these very kind words. I'm going to scratch, share my screen. Can, can you allow me uh, to screen share? It's currently disabled. I'll ask my colleague Christophe to make Marlina uh, co-presenter. Yes, not working. All right. Um, can you all see my presentation? Great, okay. thank you. Go ahead. Wonderful. So um, thanks again for these very kind words and for inviting me to um, hold this webinar today. Um, so in the next 20 minutes or so, I will um, present some of the results of my PhD dissertation. Um, specifically on the question, um, as Dirk has already outlined, of how the international community shares the burden, so the cost and risk involved in um, providing peacekeeping. And burden sharing is oftentimes a very cumbersome and challenging process, um, but, and I'm not already taking, um, giving you the conclusion of today's talk, um, there are many reasons to be optimistic about the um, prospect of peacekeeping burden sharing. So at a time when multilateralism is often said to be uh, in crisis, peacekeeping continues to be a remarkable enterprise of multilateralism and international solidarity, as the uh, UN Secretary General Guterres um, has said. So I'll first now outline um, some of the challenges of uh, peacekeeping burden sharing before presenting some of the more optimistic results of my research. Um, so the challenges are both a demand and a supply side challenge. Um, so as you can see in this picture here, there's been a steep rise in um, peacekeeping operations um, after the end of the Cold War um, in the 1990s. And um, after a, a brief drop in op uh, operations, especially on UN operations, um, after failures in uh, Somalia, Rwanda, and um, Bosnia in the 1990s, um, peacekeeping has again expanded in the 2000s. So in the past uh, years, there's been 
um, up to 40 simultaneously active CSP operations um, deployed per year. Um, alongside this quantitative rise in the number of peacekeeping operations, um, peacekeeping has also expanded in scope. So peace operations do not only um, focus on traditional peacekeeping tasks of um, monitoring borders or ceasefires, but have more multidimensional peace building tasks and also some peace enforcement um, activities. So these tasks um, include um, humanitarian uh, action, humanitarian support, um, human rights monitoring, election supervision, DDR, SSR, et cetera. And especially the more recent trends to have more militarized stabilization missions, um, such as in Mali or the Central African Republic, um, has led to increased tensions between um, Security Council members or trip contributing countries and also um, diverging visions of um, peacekeeping. So this rise in the, um, in the scope and um, scale of peacekeeping, of course, also entails um, rising resource demands to successfully um, launch and deploy these peace peacekeeping operations. And this includes both financial and personnel uh, resources. Um, so in 2018, um, there were around 200,000 um, peacekeepers um, deployed um, uh, worldwide, which is the, the most recent um, year in the figure on, on the slide. And um, this uniform personnel comes from over 120 different um, countries. And here we have also seen a shift in recent years. So while during the Cold War and in the 1990s, it's been mostly Western countries providing peacekeepers, um, more recently, um, the majority of peacekeepers um, have been coming from the global south, so especially South Asia and Africa. Um, so, for instance, from um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, Nigeria, Ethiopia, those are some of the biggest contributors. So, there's been increased risk um, between um, who the countries um, that um, mandate peacekeeping, so the Security Council members, especially the P5, then the countries that pay for peacekeeping, so um, US, China, Japan, Germany, uh, France, and then the major trip contributing countries. And um, the difficulties in procuring the resources necessary for key peacekeeping are reflected in this quote by former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, um, where he said in 2011, um, securing the required resources and trips has been consuming much of my energy. I've been begging leaders to make resources available to us. And this challenge has regularly led to delays uh, in the provision of peacekeeping and an undersupply of resources. So um, uh, on average, um, United Nations operations take about 10 months until they reach peak deployment. And they're, they're on average uh, more than 20% below their authorized troop levels. But it's not only the end that of these difficulties. Um, the um, EU mission in the Central African Republic in 2014-15, uh, for instance, was in jeopardy due to insufficient um, personnel and aircraft commitments and could only be deployed after six so-called fourth generation conferences and uh, a number of a couple of months delay. Um, so this now leads me to a further challenge in peacekeeping burden sharing, um, which is while the majority of the debate around this topic and the academic literature focuses on the United Nations, actually in recent years, regional organizations and um, individual or coalition of states um, provide the majority of peacekeeping. And as you can see in this table here, especially in Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa, regional organizations have actually deployed more peace operations than the United Nations. And on top of that, um, there's a multitude of further actors involved in the peacekeeping burden sharing process. So um, you might, you often have uh, multiple simultaneous operations deployed in a conflict area uh, together with uh, other UN agencies, uh, NGOs, or private security companies. And then within each organization um, engaged in peacekeeping, there are a couple of other actors uh, involved in, in their internal processes. So, for the case of the EU, um, you might have the, the Council, the Political Security Committee, the Military Committee, Operation Command, and of course, the, your member states. And then at the level of individual troop contributing, contributing countries, um, you might have uh, the government, parliament, um, the public, civil society, military, all involved at, um, uh, in decision-making processes. So in my PhD research, 
I explored different aspects of peacekeeping burden sharing at different levels of analysis. So between organizations, within an organization, and here I looked at the EU, and uh, within individual troop contributing countries. So starting with the first level, um, in 2015, um, uh, Secretary Donald Ban Ki-moon and the Young Hippie Report have asserted that uh, we've entered an area of partnership peacekeeping between the United Nations and regional organizations. And the hope of this partnership peacekeeping is to um, more effectively leverage and mobilize each organization's um, capabilities and strengths. But of course, it's also uh, accompanied by, by certain challenges, such as uh, potential um, difficulty in coordination, um, duplication or fragmentation, or um, competition between actors. So in order for peacekeeping partnerships to be um, successful, we need predictable frameworks for coordination. Um, but um, as of today, the division of labor between the and regional organization has been underspecified. So um, contributing to this effort, I explored the question under which conditions the United Nations versus a regional organization um, deploys the peace operation. And um, peacekeeping is situated in an environment of scarce resources, the entire problem behind burden sharing. Um, so there's a finite supply in personnel, in uh, equipment, in, in funding, both within an organization, but also within the international community as a whole. And this resource scarcity necessitates a, a framework for, for coordination to allocate the available resources as effectively as possible. And a quite useful concept to this effect is the concept of comparative advantage. So an organization's ability to provide a certain aspect of peacekeeping at a low opportunity cost. And building on existing research on the strengths and weaknesses of regional organizations and peacekeeping, I particularly examined um, five aspects which, um, which I expected to be most relevant in the discussion of comparative advantages of the UN versus regional organizations. So these were um, the stage in the peace process. So um, has the conflict ceased? Do we have a, a comprehensive peace agreement? Yes or no. Um, the scope of the peace operation so is this a large multidimensional mission or rather small one focused on niche activities? Um, the conflict intensity, um, the legitimacy of the operation, so um, the constant and acceptance of the conflict parties and the speed of the response or the deployment. And I tested which combination of these, um, of these factors might explain when it, the UN versus the regional organization deploys a peace operation through a qualitative comparative analysis, which is a, a case-oriented qualitative comparative um, research approach. And I then triangulated my results with a number of small case studies. And I specifically focused on peacekeeping provided by the UN, the European Union, and the African Union in Africa. And in the analysis, I found an emerging framework for coordination or effective task sharing between those three organizations. So um, the United Nations has a comparative advantage in providing large multidimensional operations, um, usually deployed in an environment where there already is a comprehensive political peace agreement in place. And um, the UN usually has a disadvantage in, deploy in deployment speed. So examples for these types of operations are or large multidimensional missions such as MONUSCA in the Congo or MINUSMA in Mali, where the end 2013 um, launched a mission a couple of months after um, the African Union and France already urgently deployed some first operations in the, um, in the country. Um, then two pathways emerged that are particularly relevant for regional peacekeeping. So the first one um, particularly said um, African Union missions. So here uh, we have an advantage in terms of being having the flexibility to already engage early on in the peace process that before there might be a comprehensive peace agreement and to provide a rapid response or a, a bridging uh, function. So basically to act as a first responder until the United Nations can take over. An example for this, for this type of mission is the African mission in uh, Burundi. Um, where originally the end was supposed to engage uh, in the country, but then was reluctant because there wasn't any peace to keep. So the African mission, Union um, deployed a mission in 2013 
uh, in 2003, sorry. And, uh, but this mission was specifically mandated to only be a bridging instrument um, until the security conditions are stable but enough for the UN to deploy, to deploy the mission. And the UN eventually came in uh, one year later. And finally, a typical EU mission is usually small in scope and focusing um, very much tailored to specific niche or gap left by another uh, organization. So uh, an example here is the uh, EU mission in uh, the DSC in 2006, which was only deployed for uh, four months during the election period at the time when the United Nations didn't have enough peacekeepers um, within their own mission, Monuc. Um, so as we've just seen, um, the international community um, increasingly relies on regional actors to uh, provide peacekeeping. One of the main actors involved here is the European Union. So as a next step, I explored um, burden sharing between EU member states at the EU level. Um, here in this figure, you can see um, participation in an average troop contributions by EU member states to EU military operations. And here the, the blue columns are EU 50 member states and the yellow columns are accession states that joined after 2004. And um, you can see um, some stark differences between countries here. So um, France is the single biggest contributor, um, but you can also see differences between EU 15 and the accession states. So um, why do we see these differences? Uh, what explains uh, why member states' contributions to EU operations? And um, the focus usually discussed in the literature um, center around uh, conflict level and contributor level determinants. So conflict level motives could include um, regional stability, refugee flows, um, trade interests, or colonial um, historical ties. And contributor level determinants include um, resource constraints or financial benefits through um, in contributing to peacekeeping or um, military training and then experience uh, through peacekeeping. Um, but in this, addition to this, um, some anecdotes and single case studies um, also highlight the role of relationships and interactions between EU member states in the process of um, fourth generation for EU missions. So a prominent example here is Germany's contribution to um, the mission to the EU force in the Congo in 2006, where it's often highlighted that Germany only became the lead nation in the, in the operation and provided the headquarter um, and uh, a third of the troops um, through peer pressure, especially pressure uh, by France. And other factors uh, highlighted here are uh, Germany's desire to um, show commitment to the development of the EU as a security actor and also to increase its influence and further European integration processes. Um, Another example is the EU mission in, uh, in Chad and the Central African Republic in 2007, where France, which was the pivotal or the, um, the driving state behind the operation, um, used political side payments and issue linkages um, to increase um, contribution levels. Um, so for example, they offered subsidies to contributions and um, some um, and support for um, certain voting mechanisms and um, political candidacies. So based on these examples, on these cases, we can expect that the interrelationship between EU member states positively influences their participation and troop contributions to EU peace operations. So interrelation properties might include um, a state's position in the network of, uh, of countries, uh, its relative power or dependency, um, institutional ties, um, political policy alignments, and these interrelationships um, provide additional incentives for countries to provide um, peacekeepers. Um, so, for example, um, site payments or um, status enhancements, increased influence in other EU developments or other host trading practices. And um, these increased linkages and, and ties further facilitate negotiation and cooperation, cooperation by um, increasing the flow of information, trust, reciprocity and um, shared norms and objectives. So I tested this um, argument in one of the first statistic analysis of uh, EU peacekeeping. Um, I used a fixed effects logic and a negative binomial regressions here. 
And the analysis confirmed the argument and especially highlighted five uh, interrelational um, properties. So first, um, dependency on the EU as an export market, which doesn't come as a surprise given the EU's uh, trading power. Um, further, the centrality of a country within the network of intergovernmental organizations. So how many shared IO memberships does, has a country with other EU member states? Um, in addition, um, side payments in form of the receipt, uh, receipt from the EU budget, um, dependency on arms imports from other EU countries, and also um, a member state's policy similarity with other EU member states. So these factors are offer additional incentives for EU member states to contribute trips to EU operations in addition to contributor and conflict level determinants. And they also um, provide a point of leverage to mitigate issues of under supply and collective action problems in peacekeeping. And finally, I want to discuss some of the uh, actors involved in burden sharing at the national level, and specifically the question uh, whether policymakers consider the public when deciding how many trips to send to a peace operation. And while early research was skeptical that um, the public had any influence on foreign affairs. Um, more recent research agrees that um, yes, the public is capable of forming stable opinions about foreign policy issues, um, but foreign policy issues um, do play a role in electoral campaigns and that as a consequence, um, elections can be accompanied by shifts in foreign and security policy. But does this also apply to peacekeeping? And here we have two important components. First, elections and um, public attention. Um, so elections are the main mechanisms um, through which um, the voting public um, can hold their elected officials accountable for their policy choices, including peacekeeping policy. So being faced with public scrutiny at election times, um, elected officials have become particularly sensitive to, um, to the public and public uh, its interests um, and might change policy accordingly out of fear of losing office. But every time uh, the government or individual uh, officials make a policy decision, they face resource constraints in terms of um, time, um, space on the agenda, um, budgetary limitations. So accordingly, um, we can expect that um, uh, elected officials um, invest available resources into um, policy areas that are high up on the public agenda but disinvest some policy areas that have low public attention. And the concept of interest here is the concept of public attention. There's so the resources the public is willing to invest in a certain issue. And public attention is the volatile and goes up and down through uh, issue attention cycles. And um, following, I um, proposed the hypothesis that um, elections um, have an effect on um, peacekeeping policy, especially troop contribution levels to peacekeeping, but that this effect depends on the level of public attention to uh, peacekeeping operation. And I tested this hypothesis through a uh, fixed effects OLS, uh, OLS and negative binomial regression analysis on troop contributions by number of democracies to young peacekeeping. And here I used um, internet search data, specifically Google Trends data, as a measure for public attention. And here's an example of a Google Trends search result. And uh, this is an example of the popularity of the search term Yunmus. And um, here you can see, um, so Yunmus was launched in July 2011. And this is the, the first spike you can see on this graph here. And um, then interest in the mission peaked in December 2013. Um, when uh, a violent conflict erupted in South Sudan. Um, so now to the results. Um, when elections are considered individually, the results suggest um, that um, fear trips are deployed when elections are upcoming. And this result is actually in line with some existing research which suspected that um, democratic leaders under supply um, peacekeepers when elections are upcoming out of fear of the cost of casualties and repercussions at the ballot box. However, um, 
when we include public attention as an interaction into our analysis, the results become much more nuanced. So um, this plot here on the slide um, shows the marginal effects of upcoming elections on trip contributions for different levels of public attention. So um, looking at this thick gray upper sloping line, we can see that um, when public attention is low to the left hand side of the plot, the marginal effect of being one month closer to an election is actually negative. But when public attention is high, the effect becomes positive. So when public attention is low to peacekeeping, um, policymakers um, withdraw troops and invest their scarce resources in other policy areas of higher attention. When public attention to peacekeeping is high, on the other hand, uh, policymakers invest resources and uh, actually provide more troops to peacekeeping. So the results confirm that public scrutiny and public attention affect play a role in um, domestic peacekeeping um, policy making. So now concluding, um, not unlike other instances of collective action, um, peacekeeping um, has uh, oftentimes faced challenges of uh, undersupply, shortfalls and delay in procuring the required resources. But as my research has shown, an increasingly manifold and interconnected set of factors at different levels of the burden sharing process um, meet these challenges. So uh, the United Nations and regional organizations strive towards partnership peacekeeping, and they start developing more predictable frameworks of, of for coordination. And then the relations ties and associations with other countries um, have, have been shown to incentivize states to contribute to peacekeeping. So this is a dynamic that can be leveraged to uh, mitigate fourth generation problems, but also gives hope for the success of collective action in increasingly connected global and regional communities. And finally, um, public attention to peacekeeping positively influences troop contribution levels. Um, so this offers a favorable perspective on public sentiment towards peacekeeping, um, but also a, uh, a point of leverage um, that civil society actors could use to influence peacekeeping policy by raising public attention. So um, governments don't need to be, need to be worried about, worry about um, providing peacekeepers, but should instead engage in an open dialogue with uh, their domestic society and, and civil society. So peacekeeping continues to be a demonstration of how the international community can come together and collectively um, manage armed conflict and um, provide um, conditions for sustainable peace. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marlene. And I immediately pass on the floor to uh, Professor Inavile. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation, uh, Marlene. And thank you also for letting me read your thesis. Um, and congratulations, of course, for this prize. So I've tried to, to regroup my comments or my questions on, on your three levels. Uh, so echoing a bit uh, about your different uh, levels of analysis, the global, uh, the regional and the national one. Um, but feel free to pick and choose which questions that you want to address. Um, you mentioned this uh, briefly in your presentation that we see different trends in peacekeeping at the moment. On, an, on a global level, we can see that um, there is uh, there has been more deployments to areas where peace is not yet um, a condition, where there is no peace um, to keep, let's say, to, to areas which are still far away from post-conflict um, environments. Um, and we've also seen, as you mentioned, that peacekeeping operations have tended to, to become more robust with more uh, use of military force. Um, we have the examples including MINUSMA in, in Mali, uh, UNMIS in, in South Sudan, and of course MINUSCO in the DRC. Um, so I was wondering how do you see this trend playing out uh, in the near future in terms of burden sharing on a global level and a regional one? Are we likely to see more UN authorized uh, regional organizations take on such missions? Um, or uh, do you see the UN adapting more to these challenging challenges and then actually moving a bit further away from the holy trinity from UN peacekeeping? So the limited use of force, the consent of the host state um, and impartiality. 
And because we've already seen trends towards that, that the UN has gone a bit further away, but you also mentioned that there are di diverging uh, agendas within the UN Security Council with regards how this should be managed. So I'm wondering, that's the first uh, question. The second one, more on a regional level, but related to the first um, question or comment is the AU's uh, increasing um, position on the peacekeeping arena and we've seen that you've mentioned that also in your presentation that the AU has actually deployed more peace operations lately than the UN has done um, and I was wondering there has been this discussion and this debate uh, for the past few years about how to finance AU peace operations given their limited um, financial and material resources. And there have been uh, discussions about the UN being able to take from their peacekeeping budget to provide a more stable financing of AU peace operations, but there still hasn't been any decision on this. How do you see this? Um, what, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that there will be a decision? I know, for example, that there have been um, divisions within the UN Security Council between uh, member states about whether this is a, a potential way forward towards a more uh, equitable burden sharing. And that would also then um, move towards what you uh, discussed as a predictable uh, framework for cooperation. So I was wondering how you see this playing out in the future, if, if you think that this is the way forward. And then um, a third and final question and comment is, um, and then on a national level, uh, the gradual, you mentioned that also in your presentation, the gradual comeback, we've seen then the shift from um, mostly Western troop contributors to the global uh, troop contributors from the global south uh, during the 2000s. But we've also seen a gradual increase of European state uh, contributing troops to then in particular MINUSMA uh, during the past few years. And um, you mentioned then how the public attention plays a role in when um, when different states uh, country decides to contribute troops, but also how EU relations um, between member states influences member states decision to contribute troops. So I was wondering a bit how you could, if you could zoom in a bit on the MINUSMA uh, operation and explain a bit more about how what what type of dynamic do you think has influenced the fact that there have been so many European states taking part of that and um, I'm also wondering if you think that this is a trend that will continue, that European states will continue to contribute troops to the UN uh, more of a, in a common way uh, together, or if you think that they will focus their, um, their troops on EU missions uh, in the future. So I'll leave it at that and, and um, happy to hear your comments and responses. Thank you, Nina. Please go ahead, uh, Marina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for these comments and for, for, for reading my thesis. Um, so maybe starting first with the, the, the last question on uh, the, the trends towards more uh, increased uh, EU contributions to UN peacekeeping. And um, I think I would see this uh, in, uh, in, in this more broader trend of uh, multilateralism in, 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 in crisis in, in recent years. And I think as long as um, EU member states and the EU consider that there is a, a global crisis of multilateralism. Um, this might incentivize EU member states to further um, contribute ships to the UN level um, in order to, to um, support this uh, very fundamental concept that also fundamental to the concept to, to the origins and the continuation of the EU itself. So I would, I would expect to see um, further increases of um, EU contributions to um, uh, UN peacekeeping. Um, however, I would also tie this then um, to, uh, to, to your first question. I think this all very much depends on um, the um, robustness of the UN operations. And um, I, I believe that EU member states will continue to be quite reluctant um, to send um, their peacekeepers into um, uh, conflict intense environments and dangerous environments. Um, so um, this trend will then very much depend uh, on, on where UN peacekeeping goes and which type of, um, of uh, positions uh, EU um, troops could, could uh, uptake within UN operations. And um, I think this could also be very much uh, tied to, uh, the, uh, to public interests uh, for where their own peacekeepers are being sent. Um, 
because something interesting I found in my research that uh, when the public pays a lot of attention to a peacekeeping operation, we actually see more troops deployed. And this is um, actually quite contrary to what of existing, what of the existing literature suspected, because um, um, recent literature went to the um, to, be, to say that they suspected that um, the democratic publics are very reluctant to send their peacekeepers in high conflict environments. Um, but um, when, when studying uh, which events um, increase public attention to peacekeeping cooperation, it's usually um, events of um, humanitarian crisis or when a conflict increases or um, uh, an economic disaster. So in all of in all these humanitarian issues, public attention increases to, uh, to a peacekeeping operation. And um, related research has actually shown that um, the public isn't per se reluctant to send their own troops to dangerous environment, um, but they're actually quite um, um, stable though towards sending troops to humanitarian uh, um, interventions. Um, so there's uh, usually a moral, moral argument behind behind these findings. So I believe um, as uh, as long as there is a humanitarian aspect to the operation. Um, we can uh, continue to see uh, increased engagement by the Western countries. Thank you. Thank you, Marlena. Uh, Marlena, uh, before we carry on, could you please uh, stop sharing the screen now and then yes. we can see uh, you again, indeed. Uh, meanwhile, questions are, are coming in, so let, let me offer you a first set and, and you pick and choose. Uh, there's a couple relating to other actors. And I apologize for the background noise, but some of my neighbors, I think, are so bored because of the lockdown that they are inventing works to be done in the apartment. Um, one is, is China. There is an increasing presence of China in peacekeeping uh, operations. What are your views on this? Uh, another uh, comment is that you didn't actually mention um, NATO, uh, even though it's a main partner for many European states. Do you have any views? on the role of, uh, of NATO. And then finally, a question on EU member states. Uh, do you see more willingness uh, to participate in operations following uh, the increase in migration flows towards Europe? Do you see any links there? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you very much for these questions. And um, again, starting with the, with the last question, um, there are tendencies that countries contribute more troops to um, peace operations when they um, themselves experience increased refugee flows from conflict areas. Um, so this is a, a robust finding in the existing research. Um, uh, an example for this is also um, US uh, engagement in um, Haiti um, back in the 90s. So um, yes, I would expect uh, that um, if we see con uh, continued uh, increase in, in refugees coming to Europe from specific conflict areas where there has been uh, uh, security council managed to deploy an operation, I would suspect that um, EU countries will um, send uh, more trips to those um, operations. And um, in regards to NATO, um, so I haven't studied NATO in my in my framework for coordination between regional organizations and the United Nations, but I suspect based on some historical cases that they would fall into a similar pattern as uh, as African Union peacekeeping um, to be a uh, to be able to deploy a more robust force uh, and also to be a bit more flexible in their deployment and in their deployment speed than the more um, um, bureaucratic um, UN process. And um, then finally, on uh, the question on China and peacekeeping. Um, so in, peacekeeping has often been used as a, as a tool to also enhance a country's position on the world stage. Um, so increase its reputation, um, maybe even like, start a bit for a security council seat. And um, I think this is a tendency we are currently in the past years have been seeing for China. Um, to uh, the tendency to, to be 
be wanting to become a more reliable uh, uh, actor um, on in, in multilateral settings. Um, yes. Thank you, Marlene. Um, a few more from Professor Anne Dighton from uh, Oxford, uh, who I uh, welcome uh, here, uh, uh, though I cannot see her. Uh, thank you, Anne, for, for joining. Uh, she congratulates you with your published and research talk. Uh, a question, uh, isn't there a, a widespread reluctance uh, pushed by Trump, but perhaps more widespread than we think, to get uh, involved, militarily involved across borders? Uh, and perhaps the, the pandemic has also played into that. So asks uh, and Dighton, how would you try to encourage public support for peacekeeping operations in this new world? That was one um, question. Um, another question that also relates to, to issues that might um, uh, influence countries' willingness um, from Kieran Doyle. Uh, do you see a link between the health of the global economy and the degree to which countries are uh, willing to commit to uh, peacekeeping? And then finally, there was a rather more specific question about the election, uh, election cycle. Um, what kind of period um, are you looking at? Uh, is it months, uh, years before an election? From, from which point in time does this uh, play a role? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so regarding the election question, um, in my uh, study, I used a, a count measure of the number of months until the next election. So it's, it's on, on a monthly basis. I also did a, did a robustness test where I used a yearly measure um, for uh, election year versus not election year, and I found similar results. Um, so economic factors are usually an important uh, factor for a country's decision to contribute to peacekeeping, and um, usually uh, richer countries are uh, have been sending more troops or contributing more financial resources to, to peacekeeping, particularly through the um, UN assessment mechanisms. And um, now Anne's question. Um, so yes, we've, we've seen a reluctance to look beyond borders in recent years. And um, I believe one way to um, to increase participation of uh, or a willingness to, to, to look beyond borders and engage in uh, faraway conflicts is to, ma to make um, two claims. To firstly highlight the humanitarian um, challenges. And um, I think, um, as, 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 I, as I said earlier, research has shown that the public's actually quite um, sensitive to, to humanitarian disasters. And then um, to very much highlight to the, to the private benefits uh, a country can, can gain from, uh, from engaging in peacekeeping and from um, securing a, a, certain, a certain region or certain conflict area. So very much highlight the, uh, the challenge of increased refugees um, or the challenge of um, decreased trade or um, other um, insecurity related issues. And um, I think very much highlighting the own national benefits of, of peacekeeping might um, increase willingness to, to say, yes, this is good for us and let's contribute to, to an operation. Thank you. And you got an immediate um, follow-up uh, on, on China. Uh, I really doubt. Is China's attempt to become globally more recognized as a responsible power the only reason to deploy troops? Or if you look at it from a realist perspective, is this about um, self-interest as well? For example, is it linked to uh, natural resources? Um, I add a couple more for you to pick and choose from. We have a question from a colleague at the UN Directorate of the Belgian Foreign Ministry who wanted to ask you specifically about your views on how to improve uh, EU-UN cooperation. And apparently there's a new uh, statement of intent there on the part of the Union. Um, another question uh, is about uh, whether you have seen any evolution in, in terms of normative approach when you compare the UN, the EU and the AU, for example, uh, in, in how they deal with, with the protection of uh, civilians. 
And the final one here on my list is very specific. Um, did your research look at multinational rotational contributions to UN miss missions? For example, the plug and play set up in MINUSMA by Norway together with several EU member states. And if you have, do you think this is a useful, uh, this is a useful model? Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for the question. Um, so no, I have not looked at multinational rotation. So um, unfortunately, I can't say um, anything on that topic. Um, in in regards to the China questions, I mean, I'm not an expert on China, and I um, actually haven't chi studied China in, in any of my PhD research. But um, yes, of course. Um, just like any other country, there are lots of private benefits China aims to gain from, from providing peacekeepers, uh, such as uh, the resources that you mentioned or um, influence in, in, in Africa. Um, I mean, there's been also some interesting tendencies in recent years that China has been um, more engaged in more, some more robust functions, um, not only providing logistical support or office support, um, which is an interesting development in terms of um, China's previous reluctance to engage in, in other states' affairs. Um, so in terms of further improving cooperation, um, I think one of the most important factors is here to, to really have these um, frameworks in place for how to coordinate. And um, I think this has mostly been happening on, on ad hoc basis or individual countries um, have certain preferences. And um, I mean, as, as, as in my research, we can see patterns for a predictable framework for coordination. And I think uh, one of the next steps should be to formalize these frameworks and formalize them for um, different levels of cooperation. So on the, on the um, strategic level, on the operational level, training, on tactical level. And um, to further enhance um, coordination, um, to further enhance communication and um, and just patterns of working together. Thank you. And final two questions. Um, one uh, from a, clearly a Belgian military colleague, judging by the email address. Um, uh, peacekeeping operations have become increasingly integrated or, or comprehensive. Um, do you see any thematic convergence then between the EU's domestic agenda, which is also very much about climate, environment, and the peacekeeping agenda? The other question from a colleague at uh, TIFF in Berlin. Um, uh, have you seen any uh, criticism of, you know, uh, in the sense that certain EU member states criticize others for not doing enough uh, in terms of troop contributions? Mm -hmm. Um so yes, I've seen some criticism um, when um, researching paper on, on um, EU coordination. I um, also looked at some of my background research, or uh, looked at some WikiLeaks tables of uh, uh, WikiLeaks of diplomatic tables, and you could find if you mostly on US and NATO, but where um, diplomats specifically said that they need to push other member, other other countries to, to send more and to. Um, get these legates to um, contribute to their fair share. So um, you could clearly see this language in, in some of the existing um, communication. And um, here, I think especially France from a lot of the existing examples has been one of the main countries pressuring other member states to, to contribute their fair share. Um, and to explicitly design strategies of how to um, leverage um, some other horse trading to, to get other member states to, um, to increase their contribution levels. And um, in regard to the integrated comprehensive approach and um, the mixture of the EU's domestic agenda and, and peacekeeping, um, yes, I believe there, there will be, uh, there is an increased um, overlap between the two. I mean, uh, the European Union, a lot of foreign policy has, has, has just have become more securitized. Um, so um, 
using development money to support um, the uh, African peace, peace facility and the African Union operations. So um, when we securitize more and more domestic um, policy agendas of the EU, I think um, we also see this feeding into um, peacekeeping activities. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marlene. And thank you uh, to the our very active uh, online audience today. And thank you to Nina uh, also, of course. Um, one of the, the main uh, reasons why we have this PhD prize is uh, not just, of course, to make uh, one uh, newly minted doctor very happy, but, but also to somehow strengthen the link between the research that happens in, in academia and universities and the policy world, specifically here in Brussels. And I think you've done that brilliantly, uh, Malina, uh, judging also by the many uh, questions that, that you triggered. So uh, once again, a, a warm congratulations on, on, on winning the prize. Uh, we hope that you will um, advertise also the next edition of the, of the prize, 2021, okay. potential winners. Um, and, and I really look forward to the chance to inviting you uh, to Brussels in person for uh, further discussions. With that, thank you again to everybody for, for joining us. And we hope to see you all again soon. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.